Gabba, welcome to the show. Hey, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes. I'm looking forward to an exploration on storytelling and language and facilitation. Um, yeah, me too. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah. I always start with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And do you? Or or, or, or do I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was thinking about this question because I knew that this is the one question that is definitely coming. Um. Uh, and if I can look at look at it two ways, if you if you, if I'm a facilitator and that's my job that I do, is that I I facilitate groups and people, then maybe I'm not. But 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 you know if I'm if I'm looking at facilitation as an art of making something possible, not easy, mm. possible because you know facilitation means to make something easy. I don't think I do make it easy for people. I I make it possible for people. I th and, and from that perspective, I am a facilitator. Mm. But I don't think that as a job title, I would have that. Does it make sense? It makes absolutely sense. Um, and I like the distinction between making it easy as opposed to making it possible. Mm. Because the easy way is not always the sticky way or the sustainable way. And I was, um, if you're making it too easy, then you're not, you're not making the group responsible. It sounds and, as and if you, you not, would do the work for them. And you're not exploring all the options, I guess. Mm. I think, I think, you know, there is a real difference between what's easy and what's simple. I think in facilitation, we should, we should do the simple thing, but the simple is not always easy yes. as we will. I'm sure that we will, we will stumble upon this in, in this, when we are recording this podcast of, you know, what, what is difficult about facilitation? The difficult part is making it simple. Mm. Yeah. And what does making it simple mean to you? I think for me, it is kind of, sometimes it's difficult to be simple mm -hmm. because your ego gets in the way. Mm -hmm. You want to shine as a facilitator. You mm -hmm. want others, to, you, you, are, you want to be looked at as the, go to person in the room about facilitation and about this creating this environment and sometimes because of that you do you want to do too much you want to cram all the flares of facilitation into a in, in into a into an event or into a meeting and that with that you are creating more hurdles for the people to jump through mm. and and yes that will make you shine because you want to do something very difficult but that's not the right way to do it because you know these people are coming in they don't know your tools you will build on a lot of assumptions that you know people will oh they will understand no they won't uh because your framework that you want to use is overly complex or complicated mm. so just use simple stuff and that will probably reach its goals. Simple stuff with constraints, because constraints is what makes it work, not the difficulty or the complexity of the framework that you're using. Mm, yeah. And I find the, the distinction between complicated and complex um, fascinating, that as a facilitator, don't want to make it easy but simple what i hear is to reduce the complexity and not to go down the route of the complicated i have the impression that organizations very often make it complicated which is different from complexity it's just too many rules too many words too many bureaucracy yes where this yeah. complexity is human dynamics being human in general, um, having wicked problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, I am. I'm coming from a Scrum slash Agile background, and 
I, I tend to talk a lot about what makes our work complex and what makes our work complicated. Mm. And there is a, there is this it's it's a tool called the Stacy matrix some people on this podcast might have heard about this he was a he was a, a, a i think a, a university professor from the 60s he was a he was a british guy and he came up with the matrix that you know if that there are two axes the the how and the what mm -hmm. how what the how is about the require uh, sorry the what is about the requirements the how is about the technology that we are we are we are using and if if both are out of alignment and we do not agree on the how and we do not agree on the what that's that's complex work mm. because we do not agree on the requirements and we do not agree on the tools how we might get there but complicated means that that we do not agree on the how but we agree on the what or we do not agree on the what, but we agree on the how. Mm. This 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 might be edited out because this might not be relevant. <laughs> and maybe it is. So how would this impact, how does it impact your work as a facilitator? So would you approach a complicated situation differently from a than a complex situation? Yes, because in in this in this matrix if if we have a problem about the how about how we will do things yeah then it's a technical problem mm. if we are dealing with the we, if we do not ha have agreement on the what we need to do what are the requirements then it's a business problem and the two sides of the table understand different language mm they speak they speak different languages technical people that are writing code or are doing the work they have a different they have different idea about certain words than management who are usually responsible for the requirements or the uh, and the what we need to build yeah and i think that's a fascinating field and i remember that you have worked as a translator um, yes. In your previous life, if I may call it like that. Yeah, yeah. I have um, had several previous lives, like a cat. <laughs> nice. This makes us uh, interesting, right? Um, and I would be curious what you have learned from this previous life about how to deal with this um, situation where you have diversity in the groups. They have to align and to come to a decision. And still they are speaking different languages, although they are speaking English, right? How yes. do you deal with that? Again, I guess simplicity is the key. The the problem the problem with language uh, is is that it has too many facets, it has too many layers. And uh, and and you know, sometimes people are lost in figurative language which might make sense because they come with a baggage of culture and history and family and whatever baggage you have on your back um but that that makes that makes you con that makes your context very rich mm -hmm. at the same time that richness is difficult to come through in a conversation mm -hmm. uh, therefore we need to somehow in a, in a conversation like this we need to strip away strip away that baggage and go back to the basic language that that you know maybe people whose mother tongue is not english learn we need to go back there we need to use that 800 words that is the core corpus of of the language and yes it will take away all the figures of speech that uh that you know native speakers tend to tend to go into frequently they go into rabbit holes as we say mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's a figure of of, of speech for you uh, but then what we might say instead of running into rabbit hole because that might not make that might not have the same sense for somebody else yeah we are just going to say that you are you are running into undesired complexity. Mm. Undesired complexity 
gives room for a lot of misunderstandings. Yes. So undesired for whom? For you, for me, for the organization, for the world? I guess I guess for the other people in the room that are coming from yeah. a different context, from a different culture, from a different background, from a different yeah. language. Yeah. And how do you enforce that? Because I can imagine that, especially in the context of an organization, there's there are different lingos. So you have this very typical language that you would use on an organizational level, but also on the team or team level. I can imagine that programmers, those who are um, in the software development, they use a different language than the management. And then you have the entire level of showing off. Oh, I use by using certain language, we are showing that we have a certain status, a certain yeah. level of education. Um, last week I recorded on um, language privilege, mm -hmm. um, a podcast. So how do you, how do you, do you enforce these rules and keep it? easy for the group simple the language simple to the group well something that i do is i try to i try to repeat the language that i would welcome mm. i try to reinforce the good the good examples somehow by by repeating it and by create uh, trying to trying to help encourage that and trying to help it flourish mm -hmm um that's that's one 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 thing i i like to do but what resonated me what resonated with me uh when when you were speaking was that was that you know management has a different different language and they and, and we in our organizations we you know we are not not thinking about it but subconsciously we are using military language a lot you know many times We need to rally the troops. We are on the mission. We are. Uh, we need to hit the target. I mean, where does this come from, and what what does it have to do with our organizations? Mm. And, and, and I really do do not like that language. We have a calling. Mm -hmm. I, I would prefer this over a mission. Mm -hmm. Um. And and also, you know, sometimes we say, I am not in the business of this and that. Um, how how can we make it people friendly? Mm -hmm. How can we make it feel like how can we make it more approachable, I guess? Mm. That that would be my mission to sort of establish this in an organization or or you know, at least With, in the team I'm, I'm working in to make it more palatable to make it to make it human first people first yeah how can you do that again modeling modeling and and and, and you know uh turning it up where you know turning up the behavior that I would like to see and and try to tone down the ones uh that I don't by showing again modeling and showing what yeah. good looks like in my in my vocabulary. Yeah. And finding allies too. There are there might be some people that are very who 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 might feel the same way as me. And then finding them alignment, you know, finding alignment with them and 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 we too are doing this and we too are communicating like this. Yeah. And then let's see let's see how that penetrates. And maybe also just calling it out. Oh yeah, but that that takes that takes a lot of courage, and and sometimes people on the floor do not have that. Mm. And I and I consider because you know, unfortunately, in our world, we still have resourcing problems. Mm -hmm. And when people say resourcing problem, they do not mean that we need a printer. Uh, they mean that we need more people, and that's not a resourcing problem. That's um, talent problem maybe that would be an even welcoming way to talk about this yeah. but many times in, in in meetings that i'm sitting in people are talking about resourcing when they mean people and yeah. and you know however hard i try to say yeah yeah we need we need more people we need more talent we need to recruit mm. some bright 
bright individuals yeah yeah i really feel that we have a resourcing problem and i just you know how can you not get the cue that i'm trying to give you but yeah. some people never never do but i hey this is a battle that i'm not going to give up on <laughs> so yeah. just... and maybe it's an accounting problem actually i think as long as in our accounting standards um people are a cost and not an asset <laughs> there will remain resources <laughs> okay now you are now you are now you are shedding this problem in a different light because i never thought of that 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 might be the reason for this that you know people are in the same cell as printers office rental and uh computer prices and whatever you know yeah. basically procurement yes but we cannot <laughs> write them off well sometimes we do oh yeah that was yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I and I wonder because this is just one example on how to um, bridge the language gap between different units. Um, and I think one reason why there are silos in organizations is because the silos have their subcultures and speak different languages. And um I don't remember who it was. I had a podcast guest and they gave the example of the word value. That when you use the word value, depending on the person you're speaking to, they might mean something totally different. Mm -hmm. When we speak to facilitators, usually it's it's my values. It has something to, to do with beliefs and to culture. When we speak to a programmer, or they will think about the value, the, the code in a cell. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And if we speak to an accountant, they will uh, think of the money value. Mm -hmm. So as a, as someone who works in an organization, as a scrum master who brings together different units of the organization, helps them to align to move projects forward. What would be your advice or recommendation to to help translate and to avoid misunderstandings? Do not take the meaning of words for granted. Mm. You know, we need to check what we mean by value. Yeah, if a if a if a person from finance comes together comes together with a person from engineering and a person from business, uh, what does value mean? And hopefully, it will come through the conversations. That you know, as we get into the context of this, we will figure out what you mean by value, what what a, a programmer might 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 be mean by value so do not take meanings for granted and i think that's our job as facilitators to call it out when we when we hear fluffy language mm -hmm. okay when you say that word what do you exactly mean yeah and i i you know when we because we were talking about value value states statements are like that we value honesty and courage and uh uh dialogues and and what 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 does that mean but value it can be a, a very open and very arbitrary word yeah. so how are we going to fill that void that mm -hmm. the word is 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 putting in the space so you know the question is there when you say openness how does that look on the floor mm. what does that look like on the floor when when can I point my finger at an action and say, yes, when you do this, it feeds back up to the value that you were preaching. It is this is how they are connected. Yeah. What are the good examples of openness? And what are the stories that we can tell about openness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True, because openness and um can mean something very different. Um, and what are we open about? Exactly. Um, and or, how do we or what are openness? we open to? Yes, and how do we receive openness? So um, exactly. open feedback, exactly. radical candor, 
Um, mm -hmm. And do we have the prerequisites to actually live that? Because to be open without respect, this can backfire very quickly. It will, probably it will. Um, so, you know, somehow I, I really feel that values sh should support one another in an organization or in a team even. Yeah. Uh, and 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 we should see that when we overdo a value, how it is hurting, you know, some some other values, and maybe th mm -hmm. those would be the boundaries. You know, if uh, if I'm if I'm thinking about the five values of Scrum, uh, which is courage, openness, focus, respect, and commitment, if we are if we are too courageous and we think that oh. Uh, I can see this scope of work. I think we can take in more uh, and we can't hit it. Then it hits our commitment because yeah. we are we, because of courage. We are committing to more. But then if we are not meeting that commitment, then we were just over courageous because I'm sure you have seen that some of the human traits are coming from the same root. One on one side, on the flip side of the coin, you can be confident Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you can be stubborn mm -hmm. and they are coming from the same root. Yeah. Yeah. They are. That's that's the same personality trait in you. But if you reflect it in a positive way, then you are, then you are, um, then you are confident and, and, you know, you, you ooze confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if and if you can't and if and if nobody can change your mind about something because you are so confident, yeah, then you are stubborn. Stubborn, or you are arrogant. If you're so confident yeah. that you're not um, taking anyone else into consideration, then you mm -hmm. can also be arrogant. And I like the example with the values to, yeah, to put them into the extremes and see what what does it actually mean and where is. Where is then the boundary? Yes. Yeah. Where, where yeah. the and tensions between two values that we don't want. Yes. Yeah. And this is how they, they, they are keeping each other in balance, I guess. I like that exercise to see ways, how, how much can we, how much can we increase it and where is a good moment to stop? to, to mm -hmm. draw because the boundaries to, yeah because it would go to the detriment of the other values yeah interesting thank you okay. very nice exercise I, it's a good one i frequently run it when i teach scrum mm. what do you think do most people get wrong about scrum oh how much time do we have on this podcast <laughs> as much as you want uh, I think one of the greatest misconceptions about Scrum is that, uh, oh my God, I really need to think about this because I really want to start with the largest possible misconception about Scrum. But the, the one that, that is coming up right now is that we don't need to deliver at the end of a sprint something that is potentially shippable work. Mm. that can be delivered to the customer scrum doesn't work without that feedback loop and in some organizations in some scopes of work uh that can't happen and and then people will be will, people will blame scrum on the uh on the lack of progress ah oh, scrum doesn't work for us scrum is not good yeah because you can't deliver every two weeks or every every month uh that you know that's why that's a prerequisite you are you are slashing down the wings of scrum if you do not get frequent feedback i think that's mm. the problem that some people will think that we can wrap waterfall work in two week sprints we will deliver a value at the very end of it and we call it scrum mm. I'm sorry this is not scrum this is just wrapping waterfall into two week chunks that's not good enough because you are you mm -hmm. are slashing the wings of feedback that you can learn from. And then basically what happens is to to be over ambitious on the sprint. So to, to put too much expectations in the sprint that you then cannot deliver. And if you cannot deliver, there's nothing to give feedback about. 
if I understand you correctly, mm -hmm. and then it it is not Scrum. Yeah. So 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 the the way how it it should work is that we do something very small first, mm -hmm. and then put it out to the market or to the stakeholders, and ask them to play with it. Even if it's, let's say, if we are doing an application, even if it's just a login window and you can, you type in an email address and a password and you log in, that's that's what it knows at this point. At least it can do that. And then we ask feedback from the customer. Hey, what is the next largest problem that we need to solve? Mm -hmm. And And go iteratively so that we reduce complexity. Because again, the complexity comes from not knowing what we exactly need to build and not knowing exactly how we are building it. Mm. That's that's where complexity comes from. Yeah. And I, what I hear is the, again, the, the problem that often appears on the business side in air quotes um, of hurrying too quickly into oh we need it fast we needed it yesterday and there's some things you cannot speed up and just squeezing more in a two weeks or in a one week sprint doesn't make it better mm -hmm. um and throwing more people at it will not solve the problem actually it will make the problem it may it will make the problem larger is it the too many cooks are spoiling the soup problem or where does it come yes. from? It comes from the number of communication lines in a team. Ah. So how do you know that it's a good number to work on a project? How do you? Well, Scrum advises for, for uh, you know, for 10 people. Mm -hmm. It used to be between three and nine, and now it's now it's ten. But the ten includes all the accountabilities in Scrum, uh, which means that potentially developers, people that are actually doing the work, maybe seven, seven, eight, nine. That's the that's the sweet spot because at that point, the number of communication lines is I don't know how many, but it's still still a lot fewer than you know if we had like 10, 11, 12 people on a project. Yeah. If you Google lines of communication, you will you will have a beautiful picture about this. It will look like a mandala uh, when we have like 15 people in the team. It will be nearly circular. While if, if we have only three people in the team, you know, there are three communication lines. Okay, so by communication lines, you mean everyone speaks to everyone else? Yes. And this, yeah. and this way of communication must still be effective and there must have something to talk about right so yeah. i'm just thinking of the situation where there are 20 people in copy to every email um which mm. for me has nothing to do with communication line but covering your back yeah but that's a different story yes that's a different story so i um uh, i just I don't know how how you are how we are going to do this uh, or how you are going to do this. I just looked up lines of communication and and I'm I'm just sharing the screen for you. So if you have three people, you have three lines of communication. So you, you have, have uh, four people, six just, lines. Just a second for those who um who are only listening. So the three lines of communication basically then looks like triangle, and the four people with six lines is a box with an X. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a star. Oh, okay. So everyone is always connected to everyone else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, the, and, and at 14 people, there are 91 possible lines of communication. And it, it really, as I said, it really looks like a mandala. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can, maybe you can attach a picture like this. Uh, yes. To this podcast. Or the... Uh, the listeners can go to YouTube and check the video. Mm. Yeah. And I wonder, wouldn't this even apply to any workshop? That So when we think of facilitation and um, the risk of over-inviting people, 
Mm-hmm. So, oh, we want to be inclusive. So let's invite everyone who could possibly benefit from the workshop instead of any everyone who could possibly contribute to the workshop. And then thinking about what's happening afterwards. I think having these lines of communication in mind that after a workshop, you want everyone to, to be in a conversation with each other to drive the outcomes. Mm. It might actually be a good way to to dial down the number of participants. Exactly, because if there are too many too many participants, then uh, you have just navigated yourself into the passerby syndrome. Mm-hmm. When you know, if if somebody if somebody collapses on the street, and it's a busy street in London. Uh, nobody's going to go there and help. Mm. If you collapse in a village and there are three people around, they will go and help you because nobody's looking at the other person to help. But in London, in the Oxford Circus, there are hundreds around you. It's not my problem. It's yes. not my cup of tea. I don't need to contribute. And that happens in the in, in big groups as well. You you hear it oftentimes in like town hall Zoom calls. Okay, who wants to talk about this? Nobody will want to talk about if it's an 80-person Zoom call. Put people in breakout groups of, groups of four, and they will immediately talk about yes. it and, and ask about, okay, uh, we have had like seven breakout rooms of four, okay, 28 people. What was some of the key learnings in that conversation? Yes, and I think... I think there are different layers there. One is, it is, and there's a difference between the village situation and the city situation and the number of people. So I think it's, well, it's daring to speak up in a large group. Um, And online, we don't have the opportunity to double check with anyone who's sitting beside us, whether Mm -hmm. it's smart enough or reasonable to speak up. So, or, or you know, we can't check. We can't check the temperature in the room. Yeah. You know, if I if I feel that somebody is not somebody is not 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 upfront about something, you know, a, a person is saying something that I do not find true, and I say, hmm, I, I, I pull <laughs> a face like this. Yes, I can immediately check around whether whether I I, I can see see any other uh, anybody else pulling yeah. the same face or a similar yeah. face, and then if I do that. I might have the courage to actually raise my voice, but online with, with, uh, with, you know, with, uh, I say, I always say muted cameras, which covers <laughs> muted it both. cameras. Yes. Uh, it, it, you can't, you can't do that cross check of, okay. Uh, Am I the only one, one who disagrees? Same way. Yeah. Yes, exactly that. Yeah. And you are just sitting in your own silence and say, oh my God, this is not, yeah. this is not how it is. Exactly. And that's why it's um, these breakout rooms, when asking a question into a space, these breakout rooms are so important. Um, Also to create rapport. And I think it's a great opportunity for organizations to build bridges across silos because the Zoom gods will decide who will be with whom anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I wonder, so you mentioned it will be different on Oxford Circle as opposed to a village. And I even wonder whether it would be different on Oxford Circle, just a smaller street in London. Because there has been research that there is a kind of bystander effect. If there are a lot of people around, then it's easy to think, or oh, someone, I am in such a hurry, but there are so many people, someone else will take care mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. If there are fewer people, then um, there is a higher sense of responsibility for each Mm -hmm. Um, and then the likelihood of doing actually something and asking if you can help um, is higher and yeah and this applies to to workshops and organizations if it's too much of a group oh someone will pick up the task and do the work Um, but if it's small then um, we have each other's back and we see each other's responsibility Mm -hmm. in doing the work yeah exactly that exactly that so you know the the number that is working well for me is 12 to 16 
that's what that's what that's where that's where my number lies for for facilitating groups mm. i i tend i tend to want to be around 12 12 is a 12 yeah. is my stronger pre preference than 16 what happens beyond 16 and what happens under 12 um so i like to i like to ask people to do small group work and in a small group work four people maybe in a in a small group that works well because then nobody can slack everybody needs to be engaged yes if you have more than four people in a small group let's say five or six then there might be some participants that do not add value they are just listening and that's not always helpful because that doesn't help us mm -hmm. diverge enough yeah. um if there are too too few people in a smaller circle or in a small group uh, let's say two or three, then again, we can't diverge enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I really find, you know, two is just a pair. It's not just, but it is pair work, which yeah. which has its place. Yeah. But I would prefer, uh, it, it just unlocks more creativity if there are four people in a small group. And then, the, you know, when we come back together in the plenary, or the main main body of mm -hmm. main main meeting essentially, and we have we need to listen to what each group was talking about. We can only focus on about three or four different groups, and not five or six or ten. Yeah. By the time we go in the in the round, we are exhausted if we have like uh, 25, 24 people, which means six groups of four. That's yeah. just too much. We can't contain it in the head. It doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a numbers game. Yeah. That's that's why it. my sweet spot yeah. is definitely 4, uh, 12 to 12 to 15, 16. So do, dividable by four. Or three. Or three. <laughs> that's yeah. another option. And, and yeah. you know, this is why I love 12. <laughs> yeah. And by two, I think, because I, as you said, um, the, the pairs have their place. And I think especially, I like to increase the group size also to take into account those who are maybe more introverted, to build trust mm -hmm. in the beginning, just turn to your neighbor, have a small conversation to check in. Yeah. Um, but then when it comes to doing the work, I realize that if there are only two, it's easy to to get distracted and to do something else. So I, you'd, maybe one of them doesn't want to do the work or find something else more interesting. It's easy to, to just say, ah, let's do something else and to agree. If they're a third person, then the likelihood of sticking to the task um, is higher because then mm. nobody wants to be the person to say, ah, let's do something else. Mm -hmm. It's like two people... Um, agreeing to be accountable, um, accountability partners to go to the gym, for instance, and then it's so easy. Ah, oh, shall we have coffee? Yeah, let's have coffee instead. If they are three, the likelihood of really going to the gym is higher. Okay, I I will I will take away this from from this from this dialogue that we are having now, this conversation. Right. I mean that I even um, experienced this in my private life. It is easier to sway another person, but it's difficult to sway two of them, I guess. Exactly. And usually when there are three, there's always this one person said, oh, come on, guys, let's do it. We passed. Ah. Mm. The good conscious of the group. Mm. Yeah. I used to be that person when I was younger, going <laughs> out partying, you know, and then... When people okay, this this will be edited out. Never mind. So I I just have this. Um, you know, when we are going out partying and people start to get a bit boozy, a bit too much to drink, and then courage comes in, and then I was the one to stop. Hey, dude, let's let's not let's not let's not go to the uh, girls' room at this hour or something like that. Yeah. So th this, this yeah. it won't end well. Let's not go into that pool now or. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the good conscious. Yeah, the good the little Jiminy the cricket. Hmm? Jiminy the cricket from Pinocchio. Mm. 
that's 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 uh, yeah uh, the, the the problem with side tracks is that sometimes they 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 will become very relatable to the topic that we talk about you know as, as facilitators i think we are jiminy the crickets sometimes mm. we are the good conscious of the of the group interesting and when you so how can it wicked question how can it be that we are the good conscious of the group um, and still provoke them. Yeah, maybe that's exactly the good conscious because it is the courage that we need in order to provoke them, um, to get them back on track and to get the best out of them, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly that. We are just holding a frame for them. And we are setting up the boundaries mm. and and we we want to see certain behaviors like courage, like depth of exploration, like, you know, something yeah. out of that. And, and we are just giving them a space to do just that. Yeah. But we need to keep them focused to do that because we are driving for an outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they need to bo be bought into that outcome. Yes, if they don't see it, then there mm -hmm. will be too many side tracks. Mm -hmm. What is your number one facilitation challenge? Finding simplicity, I guess, in in the way how I craft my invitation. Mm. That's the that's the toughest for me. I love talking. I love to shine. Yeah, I'm. I have my ego. <laughs> I have my ego and I and and I'm um I can be an extrovert at times, but it mm -hmm. is not about me. Yeah. And keeping myself in check so that I I I I resort to simple language and I phrase my invitations in a simple way. Mm. That to, in order to do that, I need to understand where I want to get to. I need to like peel the layers of the onion and find a core of where I want to get to and ask about the core rather than the outside layers. Mm -hmm. It's very tough for me. Phrasing a nice invitation, that's the biggest challenge. And I just spend long hours on crafting the right words, which are which are taken from this 800 word core library of the English language. And when you say invitation, is it the invitation for an activity, for the session, for the work? It's an, in, it's, I think when you are, when you are, when you are using written language, when you write an email, when you write the invite, the, mm -hmm. uh, mm. for, for, for mm -hmm. this, for the session, you can be a bit more playful with words because because if somebody doesn't get it or somebody wants to use a dictionary that's built into our computers these days, they can do that. And I can I can be a bit more maybe a bit bit more verbose and playful mm -hmm. in my language. But when it comes to me asking for people to do something at the workshop, giving instructions, uh, that's when language plays crucial role simple language plays cru mm. a, a crucial role that you know the instruction is simple to understand it's not it's not too long yeah. it has it is it is it is made up of short sentences that people can understand and starts with a verb <laughs> maybe if possible <laughs> yes and it's um it's interesting what just crossed my mind is uh, where technology suddenly became our friend um, and reinforces this because I now started to make sure that the instructions, that I always put the instructions into the chat mm -hmm. because I cannot expect everyone to listen all the time and to be switched on just because I decided to give instructions now for the next mm -hmm. step. So if I want to, if I want my instructions to be readable and 
um, easily understandable in the chat. They have to be very short. And I usually start every every part of the instruction with an emoji that would kind of be a visual clue for what they have to do. That's the second thing I am taking away from this conversation now. Mm. Yay! <laughs> yes. You are you are making me a better facilitator. Ooh. What makes a good facilitator? What makes a good facilitator? Yeah. Being able to hold the space, I guess. Mm. You know, again, getting the ego out, leaving leaving the ego at the reception, I guess. Yeah. That that would be for me. That that's what that's what good facilitators do. It's not about the frameworks. It's not about the instructions. It's yes, okay, it is about the instructions, but then let people letting people figure it out themselves, not wanting to save them. Mm, because oh yeah. you know you are you are you are then attached to the to the outcome of this but you know there might not be an outcome yeah and and that's where it becomes tricky or complex because in order to in order to have clarity on where you want to guide them and that's what you said you need very clear understanding of where you want them to go in order to create the simplicity in the invitation. Exactly. And at the same time, you want to be open and not attached to the outcome. Mm -hmm. You want to be challenging and you want to create constraints for them because constraints just ignite creativity and mm -hmm. creative thinking. But how can you how can you create a space where this constraint happens? You invite them into this constraint in a simple way. The constraint is visible. It's understandable for everybody. And then by going through that constraint, they will we will get to an outcome through our creativity. Mm. But sometimes it can happen that you know you didn't measure the or didn't portion or didn't measure didn't set up the exercise correctly and you don't get to the outcome because the constraint was not understood or it didn't lead to the right result that you wanted mm. and then what happens i don't know what happens then because because you know this is not a good place to be and you will have to reassess and that's when you can come in as a as a savior yeah rather than rather than rather than leaving a, a fruitless meeting which 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 the outcome of which is that me giving these instructions to this sort of people to a, around this constraint today didn't work yeah to an, yeah what is the outcome it's um too much divergence so not bringing it back to the to convergence and to alignment mm -hmm. and ultimately a decision or an action mm -hmm. or getting lost in tangents. Yeah. Yeah. When people are too much bogged down in thinking outside the box, because that's good. Creativity is welcome. But then if we are not keeping the focus and the attention of the group. So th this is why I'm, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, the holding space. Mm-hmm being able to hold the space and keeping the boundaries so how how can we create a box that we need to think outside of but still keep the thinking outside the box in the boundaries of our yeah. our goal or just making the box I, bigger <laughs> so that we can still stay inside the box exactly but then how are we how is the creative how is the creative thinking outside the box come if we are yeah. always making the box big you know this is that yeah. uh, i can i can see a fractal unfolding here a spiral yeah. something like that yeah it, um, when i think of the boundaries um that we need in order to be creative i i somehow always think of a um in street art tour that I took in in London and the tour guide pointed out at uh, 
swing gums on the on the pavement that an artist used at, as canvas for their art because mm -hmm. street art was uh, banned so it was illegal because you were not allowed to destroy um the uh, property exactly so by drawing on a gum that was on a pavement it's not it's not public property mm -hmm. um and i think to find such a sweet spot of a very clear boundary and restriction that suddenly opens up um creativity in a very out of the box way but you can you can see something very similar when you know let's say there are pipes coming out of the wall of a house mm -hmm. in london and then there is a street artist that will see an elephant's trunk in mm. that pipe and yes. then just throws an elephant around it uh you know these are the constraints that we as facilitators need to create yeah and and figure out okay i'm giving you a pipe out of a house that is coming out of the house what are you going to draw around it mm. yes and then yeah and then what makes a constraint a good constraint this is a good constraint for me that you have just set up because it is challenging to answer there is not a simple answer to this, so I will need to be, be you know, digging deep into finding an answer to this. Um, and uh, and I have the time and the space to reflect on this and dig up something and, and then bring it to the fore. So I think it needs to be challenging. It needs to be, in you know, the instruction needs to be simple. Mm -hmm. And I need the facilitator to hold the space for me to think. And I want the facilitator to think that I can do this. Mm. So that it's not for, so challenging without being frustrating. That's what I hear. Yes. Because if you, can, if you don't think you can do it. You know, it's just one step out of my comfort zone or two, mm -hmm. not not wildly out there and that's what that's what teams want too i guess um you know don't give us the simple thing ask ask something that is difficult to answer trust us that we can that we that if we dig deep using your tools mm -hmm. we can find that answer and bring it to the fore and mm -hmm. and and let it shine and let it be the beautiful diamond that we will look at and then we will say wow we have unearthed this together here. Mm. Isn't that amazing? That this is the outcome of our yeah. conversations today. To because if we have constraints and we overcome them, it's deeply satisfying. It's it is it you know constraints uh, are tapping into our internal motivations, internal motivations, um, you know. Uh, that 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 thing that Simon Sinek was talking about, um, you know, um, what is it? Master in purpose, autonomy, master in purpose. Mm. Yeah. You know that we are able to work autonomously, and I think the the mastery element is that's that sort important here mm -hmm. because when because mastery is about figuring things out figuring things out that you are good at but the challenge that you have in front of you is exactly one or two steps beyond your skill level and uh and that's where you want to get to yeah and the purpose comes in that uh, i think that's another element that makes a constraint a good constraint it must be reasonable or meaningful mm -hmm. so not just a random constraint to to challenge the group for the mm -hmm. just to challenge them but in a meaningful way exactly so that so that you know we have we have an outcome and an outcome that is ours mm. 
that we are jointly responsible for, I guess. Yeah. Because we have created it. It has come from us. Yeah. And then how to do the next step? Um, and maybe this links back to Scrum, where you said Scrum is, is about delivery. And that's the biggest kind of misunderstanding that, oh, after a sprint, if you don't deliver, um, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Um, so you do have to deliver. And for that, you do need those who come to an agreement to buy in, to feel responsibility um, and accountability. How do you get there? Because very often, and I think that's that's a frustration of many workshop participants, that a workshop feels like a party where the next day you have a hangover and nobody wants to clean up the mess. Um, <laughs> where did that come from, Miriam? <laughs> that's me. <laughs> what did we say oh yeah that was fun i don't remember uh it's it's you said that uh, a, a workshop is like a party when the next day no you know which we really enjoy but the next day nobody wants to clean up the mess yeah nobody wants to own the outcome of yeah. the party the outcome of the party might have been good conversations yeah and and building relationships and 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 getting to a point that we will actually make when we get back to work or you know if it was a work related party even if it was a personal one it doesn't really matter it is something that we want to do together in the yeah. future but then who owns it yeah. and 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 where where does that get picked up um this is where i think at work accountability bodies come in to 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 play you have mentioned that you know, or an, a, a triangle of mm. a, a trio of accountability bodies, I guess, because it is easy to sway one person, but it is mm -hmm. more difficult to sway two. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe that, like drawing up something like this, could be a could be a good way. Why does it work in Scrum and doesn't work outside of Scrum? Does it not work out? First of all. Not everywhere in Scrum it, <laughs> does it work, yeah. Um, but I guess you know at the at the end of at the end of a, a team improvement meeting, which is called the retrospective in Scrum, when we look at how we collaborated, how we worked together in the in the last sprint, um, the outcome of the the outcome of the of 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 that session should be clear improvement points for the team. And the last question of the of the of the scrum master or the facilitator at that point should be, okay, who is going to own this? Who is going to take it forward? Because I think what helps in scrum is that we have a very specific point in two weeks time or in a week's time or in a month's time when we are going to check in on this. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, you know, that's what makes it a bit more sticky in Scrum than in other environments that in two weeks time or, you know, when the next sprint ends, we will have a similar meeting to this when I ask about the previous improvement points and how we did that or how we didn't do that. But I guess, you know, this is the, this is very similar in coaching as well. When you when you set up, when, when you have a, a, a client and uh, and then and then the client subscribes to doing something to change something in their life and the next coaching session should begin hopefully it does okay you said that you wanted to do these things can we check in on them how are you how are you what what is coming up when i'm reading back to you these these improvement points yeah yeah so it's clear accountability and a name linked to an activity and all and also no a, a time when we mm. check in on this again yeah i think that that is you know that's what makes it sticky in scrum because we will check in on this in two weeks time mm. which brings it back to the is it the eisenhower matrix with the urgent and important 
And it's nice mm -hmm. if it's important that you have to do it, but if it's not, it's if it's never urgent, you will never do it. So putting a and time the, there, it makes it creates urgency. It makes it urgent. It creates yeah. urgency. That's what that's what you know the sprints are about. The sprints are a fixed time box in yeah. order to create that urgency. Mm, to overcome Parkinson's law, mm -hmm. everything will take as much time as you allocate to it. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. What makes a workshop fail? I think not having the understanding of why it failed. Hmm. That's such a scrum answer. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> uh, because, you know, if we don't get to an outcome, that, that is the outcome. You know, that with, these, with, with this group of people around this constraint, with this problem, using this facilitation technique today, in this weather, in this room, it didn't work. But then... You change some of the parameters about about this workshop and you run it again with a different environment with different people and it works. Then mm. what were the things that made it work the second time and didn't make it work the first time? Because, you know, the problem with that is that too many mm. parameters have changed. You have changed as a person. Your instructions might have changed because you thought that, OK, I didn't give clear enough instructions. So I'm going to tweak my instructions. Mm -hmm. The people are different. The people already know about this workshop that you're putting together. So they will know that what's what, what thing to expect. So too many variables, too many parameters. Everything can change. So again, for, for me, I think uh, a, a, a workshop fails if 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 there are if there is no convergence at the end mm -hmm. if we are still because of the lack of time box or you know lack of time we are still not in the in the divergent mode we are still in the grown zone mm -hmm. in the middle when we are twisting and pulling and turning and churning and tugging the rope and oh that that is that is very frustrating for a facilitator because that's where that's where that's where the success success or the failure of of an outcome of the workshop um that's that's when it happens that's yeah. when that's when that's when a success or failure to reach the outcome will surface and i think it's zone. yeah it's a good point i think it's even um frustrating for the participants of course because then it, it's this unsatisfaction of okay so now what Exactly. Yeah. I think we do need, yeah, the this meaningful progress, a sense of meaningful progress to feel satisfied. At the same time, we need to leave people in the grown zone and be comfortable with the discomfort that it causes for a while. Mm. Because, that, you know, that those are like the questions that a coach asks, to which the answer is a long silence, a long pause, mm -hmm. the awkwardness, the discomfort. It's all there, sitting in the air, creating tension, creating friction. At the same time, hopefully somewhere deep down, it is unleashing creativity. It is, un it is unleashing the answer to the question of, okay, I hear that person's view. I hear that person's view. I have my own view. What is the common denominator based on which we can start alignment? But if we do not leave that grown zone open long enough and we try to make it easy for our mm -hmm. participants, that creativity that started to take root will never flourish, will never we didn't give it enough time to grow and manifest in 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 a in an answer or, or in a solution or in a mm -hmm. or in a half baked sentence even because we do not want a fully formed sentence to come out of your mouth we just want the beginning of a sentence to come out so that others can jump in on it and others can save you just like in improv which is another great tool in 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 the facilitator's toolkit Yes. Fascinating. 
what what resonates with me, what comes up is one this how can we end a workshop or a session that leaves participants on the one hand with the satisfaction of having converged and still the sense of wonder to continue to be curious like the coach as you as you mentioned exactly yeah i i i'm taking I, that's that's again the same thing that came up in me is like i think if people feel satisfied with the outcome and they want more of this mm -hmm. that's when you have won a crowd for yourself yeah that's when that's when your that's when your respect as a facilitator has just increased it's basically where the outcome is just the jumping block for the next big piece and like oh this we have and now you can see the the next stage already or something became something became visible approachable that wasn't there before exactly and and something that unleashes the potential of what's possible okay we have gotten to this point Oh my God! What comes next? Yeah. What 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 are we going to do after this? I I I feel I want to, I want to have the people leave energized mm -hmm. after after a workshop and, and and even on the hangover day feel <laughs> energized about it. Yeah. To come back to your previous example of a party. And I think curious enough, curious about each other. So, having um having had access to new minds, new ideas, new perspectives and thinking, oh, I now see something that I haven't seen before. Um, and what else can become possible through that? Mm -hmm. Which then you mentioned timing. Um, and one of the big mysteries, maybe, maybe no longer mystery, um, is timing of workshop um, and this, how long can we keep this kind of discomfort of um, grown zone? And maybe to make the question more tangible is the timing of breakout rooms. Because I think that's exactly, um, I think that's a, the micro, um, application where you want groups to have enough time to discuss about a question or to follow the instructions to come up with something meaningful mm -hmm. but not too much time so that they lose the curiosity and the interest and they lose the focus yeah yes yeah how do you determine time for workshops or breakout rooms It depends on this on the size of the task on hand. What I what I like to do is, you know, in order to st stay focused, I would I would rather break down a big exercise to smaller chunks of let's say three or five or seven minutes, and then ask the participants to come back, mm -hmm. and then give them another instruction and then ask them to go away rather than okay see you back in 20 minutes mm. or see you back in half an hour i would rather break it down to smaller more manageable chunks because yeah. then then you know with a with a this is with a this is maybe with a group that i do not know that well if i know that the participants can stay focused for half an hour then of of course it's there is no need, but even then you know I love the 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 tool in Zoom through which you can just communicate into breakout rooms, mm -hmm. and you can do that in a in a in a written in a written form, you know just just maybe maybe you should think about rounding off this first phase of the exercise now, yeah. and you should start the second phase, but you know I think that's for a bit more mature group of people who have who have a history of working together and who know me and I know them and I know that they can do this if it's a new group I would I would I would give them short bursts of yeah. of of time boxes rather than one longer yeah 
also to make sure that they're not running off uh, on a tangent mm -hmm. i'm and getting distracted will, you know, yeah and this might be will, will give me mm -hmm. the focus to bring yeah. them back yeah good one mm. and it might be a difference between the on-site and online but i think on-site yes we can sit for 15 20 minutes to be very focused on a task but online, um, it's it's a bit more difficult. Yeah. I I really I'm really grateful that you know, in in life workshops are coming back. Are Definitely. you? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just can't wait mm. to see people because you know that just gives me the energy when I see sparkly eyes. People that people that you know when when the when we. When we manage to to unearth that gem at the end, mm -hmm. I think it's more it's more visible in a in a in a in 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 the real life environment than virtually. We have we can have the satisfaction virtually as well, but you know, nothing nothing can replace in face, I guess. And I I wonder whether this is true, um, and where this feeling comes from. And I, because I think we can have the same kind of feeling and glow and excitement and sparkling eyes online. You can. What is missing though is the closing. So what happens after the closing? And I think that's the magic moment that we then remember that, okay, mm -hmm. so the official part is over and now we can go off and have a drink together or we can have the kind of more informal chit chat and start the giggling because everyone is a little bit tired and mm -hmm. everyone puts down the mask of the professional workshop and suddenly we are we, mm -hmm. as human as we can be. And these are the memories that stick. And I... I don't think that this has necessarily something to do with online or offline, but just with the timing that online suddenly it's finished. Yeah. And then it's done. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly that. At the same time, we can be we can be effective and efficient and successful in an online environment. But somehow for me and we can have the warmth but it's like it's like it's like uh watching artificial fire yeah some it, it, sometimes sometimes people have that uh, you know the, in their houses there is this artificial uh artificial um the screen playing log, the fireplace log burning fireplace but it's 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 just uh, you know a like twinkling light and I and I feel that nothing nothing replaces a a, mm. a a a campfire, for example. It it has been and and the reason reason why I feel that way is because virtual came in, virtual workshops came in when, uh, yeah, they were around before COVID, but they weren't around twenty years ago. Yeah. While sitting around a fire and talking about stuff that matters, that has been around for hundreds and thousands and hundred thousands year for for hundreds of thousands of years yeah. and 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 you know nothing in my book nothing will replace that because it because it's just virtual the the other the, the other workshops yes they can be effective they can reach their outcome mm. but, and and yes they can have the warmth as well but still come on there must be a difference mm. And I'm playing a lot with that. So um, I recently hosted a workshop and I will host it again, falling in love on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So how can we how can we help participants to fall in love with each other um, in a Zoom call? Mm -hmm. And um, just last week, we finished the third edition of the Never Done Before Festival. And there we created this space, this liminal space that after a workshop is over, we still have an online environment where we can meet to debrief so that you don't have this harsh end. And I mm -hmm. think it really, it did create this glow where you bump into someone 
where you can continue and expand the conversation beyond the official end. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we cannot. And and we had a we we even had a dance and a party together and went silly. Um, mm -hmm. Although we cannot really hug each other, so I um, and this is not to say that I don't appreciate on site um, and in real life and hugging and touching and sharing a drink or food. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, I try to figure out what it really is that makes the mm -hmm. difference, and I think it's yeah the liminal, mm -hmm. the harsh end that we can expand the ending and making more fluid. For me, for me, physical presence is also energizing. Mm. Phys physically having people in the room, they 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 do not just bring their body into the room. They they have a shine and sparkle yeah. around them, and then and then there is the way they walk, the way they show up. It's very different in a virtual environment, yeah. and and therefore I just find it important to meet with my colleagues so that. When I see them on Zoom, I can I can understand I can I can figure out how they how they show up or I can figure out their energy because I have seen them in real mm. life. Yeah, for me that's important. Yeah, yeah, to build rapport and trust. It's mm -hmm. it's not impossible on Zoom. It's not impossible, mm. you know. During during COVID, I started working for a new organization that, and and I worked there for. 18 no two years and there were colleagues that i have never seen and we have built a good rapport mm -hmm. we have we we have built a good relationship and we could work together but i'm just thinking how much easier it would have been if i if i if we went to pick up our, our lunch after one of our workshops or whatever how much easier it would have been and I think especially for, for conflictual situations. I think the hunky glory, mm -hmm. the the good, the easy, the happy can be online. Having difficult conversations online, um, clarifying conflict is more difficult. They are sitting in the same the space. It makes the room very cold. Yeah. It may, it can yeah. make the room very cold. Yeah. And and people you can see it on the faces, people yeah. tense up and yeah. And and Zoom Zoom freezes, and not because of a, but, but not because of an application problem, yeah. not because yeah. of yeah. Zoom's quality, yeah. but you know because people freeze on the call. Yeah, yeah. I think the um, the freeze or um, or flight or fly mode are enhanced on Zoom. Um, offline, maybe it's more the fight, but then at least you have energy or something to work with. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wow. We've come a long way. We have come a long way indeed. We almost talked for one and a half hours. Yes. <laughs> I wonder I wonder how much you can how much how much how much you 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 will be able to use in the podcast. Oh, I use it all. So that's the benefit of having an external editor. A um, uh, little anecdote. In the, the first 25 episodes, I edited myself. And I, um, I was very critical and edited myself out a lot. Mm -hmm. And then realized later, oh, maybe I said something that we referred to afterwards. I had to edit my back, myself back in. So it was always kind of complicated. And I have Gordon who does that and he would not edit me out and he would not think, oh, this isn't relevant. Let's cut that out. And it actually makes the conversation so much richer and so much easier to follow. Okay. And then it's yeah. just a conversation. So it's part of it. It's good to know. Also, I think for the audience, you're not on and sitting there and taking notes every single minute of a conversation. It's whether mm -hmm. maybe you maybe they're taking us on a walk, maybe uh, they're taking us in the gym or cleaning the dishes. So I do that all the time, right? So you don't so want to have such a density of information, um, mm -hmm. but you want to have it like a conversation, and then something stands out, and then you grab a piece of paper and you take a note. 
I think I think what what happened in in my life. I I just remember my parents always listening to the radio, mm-hmm. and and that was their sort of background stuff. Sometimes it's the news, sometimes it's a tune, then it's you know a, a cultural program something, uh, and and for me it's podcasts. Mm-hmm. I listen to podcasts about anything, but but you know sometimes yeah it sparks my curiosity. Write a couple of thoughts down and then. Put it, put it next to the others, the other half written sheets. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I think the even, even parts of the conversation, if they are not as rich in content, mm. we don't know what it sparks in someone, maybe a memory, maybe they, it makes it relatable. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I like the, the pure, the unedited, the long form. Okay. Okay, I I wonder how it will go down with the audience. Yeah, we'll find because, out because because I have waffled quite a bit. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I was, you know, I was, I was, I was reflecting on simplicity a lot, and mm-hmm. I didn't really express myself in a simple way. I was I was expressing the need for using uh, a, a corpus of words of eight of eight hundred words, you know, the basic yeah. um, corpus of, of of the English language, and I didn't do that. So I'm advocating stuff that I'm not really practicing in this environment. But hey, hey, maybe I can get away with it now. And it is a different environment. Of course, it is. And I think um, you seem to be a speak to thinker, and so I am. So am I. So I make sense of information by speaking about it, especially yes. in a conversation. Whereas when I prepare a workshop or when I'm in charge of holding space for a group, I would be more careful of the words that I'm choosing. So suddenly then my communication style might change. Mm-hmm. And hopefully you have made up your mind about at least the core instructions beforehand so that you can communicate them in a simple way exactly but this one today was unscripted and improvisational that's why i sent you questions that i didn't ask um Mm -hmm. so that you can blubber a bit and speak to me i did i i did i did blubber a bit and that was it was very refreshing to blubber about this Yeah. yeah good really enjoyed my time here Nice. Is there anything that you wanted to share but we didn't touch upon? Oh, there are many things. <laughs> we hardly talked about storytelling, you know. Uh, but but we but there will be a next time, hopefully. There might be a next time. I don't know how, yeah. how you are running this, but I would be happy to explore that topic as well. Hopefully this will be not be in the in the in the um in the show because I want to give you a a, a tool. Uh, or a thought that I was, you know, it's cropped up to me when we were talking about the falling in love on Zoom. Yes. And I have, I, I used it in, in real life and I don't know how applicable would it be in person. The thing, the thing is called I'm curious about. Mm. And I'm just, I'm just going to look at you over Zoom and I'm just going to curious, be curious about you. And I do not want any answer and any response. And then, and then the question for the of the facilitator is like, how did you feel when you were you were asking the curious questions, and how did you feel on the receiving end of those curious questions? Mm-hmm. So I'm curious about the books in the background. I'm I'm curious about the color of your eyes. I'm curious about about who has curly hair in the family, uh, and you know stuff like that. You are just curious about, but you know it evokes. A feeling in you as well as the person who is receiving this curiosity and it evokes certain certain attributes in in, in me as well as I'm asking these questions and the person receiving the curiosity is not replying no that's beautiful no and that's the real beauty of it and then hopefully in order to avoid responding to some of these questions or feeling the feeling the need of reciprocating the depth of the questions you switch partners yes great 
Thank you. This uh, is the one really piece that adds a, the magic. Yes. Yeah, it really adds adds because you know that is never the, the, the curiosity can never be re reciprocated and returned. curiosity can never be reciprocated in this environment and in this this is I think this is the constraint of this of this tool or or of this exercise and and how we deal with that how are we going to deal with the fact that you can't answer you can't uh, you can't ask mm. me about 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 things that appear on the screen on your end you might be curious about why am i wearing a tattoo like stuff and you might be curious about several other things don't don't say them because let let me linger with that with that with that non knowledge that i yeah. do that i don't have what i love about that is the curiosity and even the three examples you just gave made me feel seen in a very special way. And I think it's a nice exercise to reflect on how good are we in receiving? Because I think when we speak about generosity and especially in the, in our community of facilitators, we are usually very good in um, giving. Although I think um, if we, if we don't learn to receive, then it's also less satisfactory for the person giving. Mm -hmm. So if someone gives me um, a compliment and I immediately reciprocate or I diminish it, it's almost disrespectful towards the person who said it. Yes, because, because the, the feeling will be, at least from my side, is that you're recipro reciprocating it in order to avoid having to deal with the compliment that mm. I, I was giving you. And you want to reciprocate so that the the balance is zero. While I gave you a gift because I wanted you to enjoy it. Yeah. And you know, it it will just it will just show you that I'm genuinely curious about 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 your heritage, about your past, about your parents, about about the stuff that you read about all these things and what is also beautiful about it it's it becomes a gift because you're inviting me to reflect on my own heritage and my own stories about my own environment mm -hmm. um so it will also spark curiosity in myself and it hopefully hopefully it will it will help you appreciate yourself if you are a person that has a hard time appreciating themselves. Yeah. I will try this exercise. Let me know how it goes. I will. Thank you, Gabo. Thank you for holding the space for my waffling. I hope it's useful for somebody. Loved it. It was definitely useful for me. Yeah, I'm taking three things away from this at least. <laughs> Wonderful. And I was, I, I'm happy. I'm happy that I could give you something apart from a conversation. Yes, yes. Um, definitely. I, mm? I came here with a, with very little um, confidence in 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 bringing value because I do not consider myself a particularly good facilitator. I have I have self confidence issues. Yeah, so that hopefully this will be edited out of the podcast. Please do not record this. Can you please turn the recording off? <laughs> <laughs> Or this could actually turn into an entire, um, an entire different episode of the self confidence of facilitators um, mm. and humility. Because I invited you on the show because you were recommended by someone on LinkedIn yeah. to be yes. a guest. So apparently, um, your the inside and the outside view. <laughs> of your facilitation skills of course there must be a match. massive conflict of course mm -hmm. of course and that's fine i'm happy to sit on my fence <laughs> <laughs> i'm happy happy to happy to be saying that i'm not conf not, not a good facilitator i will say that because i i don't think i am mm. i have i have 
or you know it's just that i have high expectations about myself that's the other the that's the other thing that that can happen and that's what i often find myself in is that you know uh, others are writing linkedin posts that i could be writing and i do not want to write them because i don't feel that my thoughts are worthy enough mm. but when i read it from others i dismiss them because i say i could have written that uh, there's nothing new <laughs> interesting. in that interesting yeah I, I I really hate that. I really hate that about myself. But hey, I'm here to improve. And I'm, all... I'm here to deal with that after 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 all those years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm 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 opening this up as a massive massive vulnerability here, but hey, I will do it. Um you know, uh I'm I, I like to be creative. I'm I love music and I love creating music and I love writing uh lyrics or poems or poetry and I used to love that when I was a teenager as well and whenever I I, I I wrote down something or whenever I created something I felt this is oh when I was playing it again on the guitar no 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 it, it sounds like Guns N' Roses meets this and that means that and meets Pink Floyd a bit it's not original so I just shelved it I just put it in the drawer and that's what I do because it's not original it's a knockoff of something that I have heard. It's a copy of a copy of a copy. Which makes it but original. Hey, which which make which makes it this is your interpretation, but my interpretation in my in my in my in my late teens wasn't that. It was just I'm not able to produce something genuine and something original. Mm. That's why that's why I just never I just never created anything genuine and original because but now at the age of 44 it's time to time to get away for, from that kid. Yes. Now I now I just put out stuff that I feel is good enough and I don't do not care. Yeah. You know the you know the main question about here is what would you do if you didn't care about the people that are observing your work. Mm. That's that's what I learned at the age of 44. The value Beautiful. of that. I wish I had known that at the age of 18. Yeah. All these would have been all these songs that they've never been listened to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, yeah. We are all standing on shoulders of giants. And creativity is just connecting old ideas in a new way, right? Mm -hmm. and it's and it and, and now i'm learning that it is my way yeah yeah that it's it's so amazing that we are using the same same tools as facilitators yeah we are we are using liberating structures we are using whatever we are learning from other facilitators but somehow what makes it genuine and original is that how we interpret it yes how we how we phrase our instruct how we phrase our invitations how we phrase our instructions that's what makes them genuine Yes. And that's we are using the same guitar, we are using the same words, we are using the same pens and papers, we are yeah. using the same strings, we are using the same amplifiers, we are using the same knobs on those amplifiers. So why are we expecting that something original original will come out? And still it is original because is we bring original, yeah. Because we bring our energy, our twist, our stories, our our baggage, our experiences to the mm -hmm. space. And each story resonates in a different way with the audience, right? I find it fascinating mm -hmm. when you when you ask different people in an audience to summarize what they've heard in a story, you will hear very different things. Um and they might have nothing to do with each other. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that's also something that we underestimate as facilitators, that we don't know what will resonate with the group and what they will take away. Um, and that's not our responsibility. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's also a gift, mm -hmm. just like the curiosity. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I really want to appreciate because... Um, there, it is a big topic of the confidence of um, are we good enough? Are we original enough? Especially coming back to what you said earlier, the topic of ego. Mm -hmm. uh, if we 
if we really want to be good, really good facilitators, it's not about us, it's about the group. And we have to put our ego aside. This means that we will be unnoticed at the end. So how can you grow your confidence is but 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 yes we are we are un, we are unseen by the end and that's cool yes because our result will be uh, the part that we have played in yes. getting to that outcome so you know it will that will that will definitely boost my ego that i have created an environment where these people today using these tools could, could get to the outcome but i and that's important. That's what that's that, that will definitely fuel my ego because I helped them get there. Mm. It's not about me directly, but yes, it is about me indirectly, and yeah. that will be enough yeah. for now. Yeah. And if you can see it, and I think very often, especially when we are external facilitators, we don't see the fruits of our work. Mm -hmm. And hence it's yeah. difficult to to build this confidence. Mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I'm sure it resonates with many in the audience. Okay. Thank you very much for this beautiful conversation today. I, I just didn't realize how much time flew when we were mm. having fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gabo. Thank you very much. Da -da -da -da. It's the end of the podcast jingle. <laughs>